Well, now that I've gone through a bit of rebranding, I think it's only fair that I give myself a bit of a makeover as well, don't you think? Yes, it would have been more fitting to do so in the last video, what with the new name and all, but shush. With that said, though, either There we go, all freshened up. Now, how's about we get started? So I'm gonna begin with a bit of a story. After doing Obscure Kart Racers 3, I spent the next little bit trying to figure out what to cover for my next video. I didn't want to jump straight into another obscure themed video, and while I had a few other ideas in mind, I wanted to save them for later on in the year. But finally, pretty much right at midnight one night, a trailer from the PlayStation YouTube channel ended up on my subscription feed. A launch trailer for a game called Kaze and the Wild Masks. I had never heard of it before, but I decided to give it a watch, and it caught my interest quite quickly. A 2D platformer heavily inspired inspired by games from the SNES and Genesis era of the genre, sounded like my cup of tea, and it looked pretty fun as well. So I bought it that night before going to bed, and gave it a try the following evening. And, well, here I am now to talk about it. So it's easy to tell that it left at least a bit of an impression on me. Kaze and the Wild Masks was developed by a studio known as Pixel Hive, and based on my quick Google search, it seems like this was their first game, though I could be wrong. Beyond that though, I couldn't dig up much about Kaze and the Wild Masks' development, aside from the fact that this game's existence has been public knowledge since, at the latest, 2017. But as I said, I hadn't heard of it until that launch trailer went up on the PlayStation channel, and I had no doubt would have missed it if I wasn't up at that hour. I guess there are advantages to being a night owl sometimes. In any case, let's give this game a look, shall we? So the story begins with these two rabbits, Kaze and her friend Hogo, exploring this ancient temple where they find a giant magic ring of sorts. However, it ends up releasing a blast that knocks out Kaze and... steals Hogo's soul, I think? And this causes Hogo to turn into this little spirit creature, while a shadowy sorceress attacks the two and sends them flying off the floating island that they're on? Maybe I'm just jumping the gun a bit here, but it feels like there's a lot going on in a very short span of time. Either way, Hogo's new form allows him to keep Kaze safe as she crash lands onto another floating island, thus kickstarting Kaze's quest to get back to the floating island where the temple was, and free Hogo's soul from whoever that shadowy sorceress was. Now this is all the story you get in the main journey, but along the way you're able to unlock images depicting some backstory elements, and I'll admit they're a little hard to follow. From what I can gather, there was this rabbit monk of sorts who used to wield the staff containing that magic ring, and he had these two other rabbits as his students, one of which was clearly more capable than the other, but on his deathbed, I think, he chooses the less capable student as his successor, causing the other student to steal the staff and go power mad, creating an army for her cause. And this prompts these other animals to turn themselves into masks and gems? I'm sorry, I'm very confused. What I was definitely able to pick up on though is that the student that went power mad is also the shadowy sorceress from the opening cutscene. But I don't know, I feel like this backstory stuff's a little too cryptic. Either that or I'm just dumb and not understanding what's going on. But anyway, the main goal at least is straightforward. Get back to the temple, beat the sorceress, and save Hogo. I can get behind that, so let's get moving. So upon starting to play the game, it didn't take me long to realize what Kaze and the Wild Masks was specifically inspired by. Visually, yes, it takes inspiration from a few different classic 2D platformers, but gameplay-wise, Kaze takes inspiration from one very specific source. Donkey Kong Country. The four golden letter tokens, the hidden bonus areas required for long-term progression, specific level mechanics, animal buddies, or in this case, animal transformations, that alter how you play the game. Heck, Kaze herself plays like if you were doing a run of DKC2 as solely Dixie Kong. Now this may sound like I'm saying all this as a bad thing, but here's something important you need to know about me. I love Donkey Kong Country. In particular, I love Donkey Kong Country 2. And even more in particular, I love playing as Dixie whenever I can in Donkey Kong Country 2. In other words, this game is 100% up my alley. Though to those who may not have played Donkey Kong Country, or at least the original three, I'll give a proper rundown of what this game is like, starting with Kaze herself. The game keeps Kaze's moveset quite simple, with movement, a single jump, a spin attack, a ground slam, and the ability to glide by using her ears as helicopter propellers. Again, much like Dixie Kong. She even picks up items like Dixie Kong, this comparison is too easy to make. Though interestingly, there's a bit more emphasis on momentum with Kaze, as she doesn't go from zero to top movement speed right away. She sort of builds up to that top speed almost in, for lack of better comparison point, a Sonic-like way. I don't mind it though, it doesn't feel like it hinders movement at all, as you do get to top speed very quickly. Overall, Kaze controls really well, and at no point did it feel like any mistake I made was because of control issues. 
Alongside regular Kaze, there's certain points in certain levels where you get access to an animal mask, which transforms you and alters your abilities. There's a bird mask, which allows you to flap around and fly, as well as spit out projectiles. That sounds familiar. A shark mask, which allows you to fully swim. You only do a small dive down as regular Kaze. A tiger mask, which turns the game from Donkey Kong Country to Mega Man X, with both a wall jump and a dash. And a dragon mask, who can double jump and perform a more powerful ground slam. The dragon mask is used specifically for these auto-running levels. This this game substitute for the minecart levels from the DKC games. All four of these masks bring a nice variety to the gameplay, while not feeling too gimmicky, so it's a good balance. And it's fortunate that this game keeps its control scheme simple, because it does not take long before you're put to the test. In classic Donkey Kong Country style, or heck, classic 2D platformer style as a whole, this game's tough, and it gets tough quick. Literally three levels in, and you're already flapping through tunnels of thorny vines, something that many a DKC2 player will be familiar with and potentially traumatized by. Fortunately though, with the previously mentioned simple control scheme, it doesn't take long to adapt and get used to this harder difficulty curve. And barring a few specific cases, it doesn't feel cheaply hard. Though we'll get back to those specific cases in a bit. Like, don't get me wrong, it's definitely a difficult game, but full-on difficulty spikes are very few and far between. And what also helps is that, unlike DKC, there's no live system. When you die, you just go right back to the checkpoint and pick up from there. And before you say, oh, but that's not a good enough punishment, two things. One, when playing on original mode, there's only one checkpoint per level, and these aren't small levels. And two, much like in the DKC games, you only get a maximum of two hits. Though while in DKC this is represented by a second playable character, in Kaze's case your extra hit is represented by Hogo's new spirit form, who can take an extra hit for you Aku Aku style. Though on a side note, if that doesn't sound appealing, there is a casual mode that increases the checkpoint count and how many hits you can take before death. Though across both modes, you also lose the gems and golden letter tokens you got between the checkpoint and your death, so you do still want to be careful. Speaking of which, while the goal of each level is just to reach the end, there is more to seek out in levels. They all have four golden letter tokens, as mentioned before, two hidden bonus areas that give you half of an emerald, and gems that you'll need a hundred of. Getting all the letters in a level will unlock one of those previously mentioned backstory images, but the emeralds and the hundred gems are far more important, as emeralds unlock secret levels in each world, which also have an 100 gem milestone to hit, and you'll need to get 100 gems on every level in the game to get the true ending. Much like in Donkey Kong Country, getting these will often require you to keep a sharp eye out, particularly with the bonus areas area portals. Oftentimes, you'll only be able to see a tiny portion of the portal when on the main path, or a small gap that leads to the portal. Granted, I do think some of these portals are a little too hidden, but for a majority of them, a keen eye will be able to spot them. Also, unlike in the DKC games, if you fail a bonus area, you can actually try again without having to restart the level! The game's levels are set across four worlds, each with a handful of standard levels, one secret level that requires all the emeralds in that world to unlock, and a boss level. While there is a general theming to each world visually, there is still some nice variety in the settings of the levels. For instance, World 2 is the designated snow world, but it also has levels set in a windy forest, and a rocky mountain region, and even a desert. It's also helped by the fact that the environments are absolutely stunning, with a varied but consistently gorgeous color palette, especially with the backgrounds, but I'll go more into visuals later. The levels also play around with a lot of various mechanics, which helps make them distinct from one another. Now granted, yes, many of these ideas are taken straight from Donkey Kong Country. We've got rope climbing, catapults that require precise timing to prevent death, much like the barrel cannons. Heck, one of the levels in the first world is literally just Stop Go Station from Donkey Kong Country 1. But that said, the game does manage to not feel like a ripoff despite this, as the way it lays out these gimmicks and has them challenge the player feel distinct enough to not feel like a copy-paste of DKC. Plus, the game does still have its own unique ideas. Many Many which are present in the secret levels unlocked by emeralds. One of my personal favorites was the first world secret level, where right at the start, all the level's platforms go invisible, requiring you to use visual hints to determine where you can stand. This could range from gem placement, to enemy placement, to seeing background items floating in midair, or most creatively, seeing where a projectile-based enemy's attack stops determining the presence of a wall. In concept, it does sound cheaply hard, but honestly, the visual cues are strong enough that it actually made for a really fun level. And then there's the final world secret level, which is basically just, well, this. How I managed to beat it in only two tries, I'll never know.
Now that said, there was one level gimmick that I really didn't like, and it was this anglerfish ghost thing. It's an invincible enemy, with the only means of stopping it being touching these plants that emit a light that freezes it, but it only does so temporarily. This enemy is fast though, and because of that, it can very easily become a pain in the neck to deal with. It appears a few times throughout the game, but most irritatingly in one of the auto-running sections. And I get what they were going for in this case, it's basically Haunted Hall from DKC2, but it is far too demanding in this case. You miss one stun plant or accidentally touch one that increases the ghost's speed, and your chances of getting to the next stun plant before it catches you are near non-existent. Out of all the regular levels in the game, this is the only one that really felt like a difficulty spike, and I wasn't a particularly big fan of it. So on the topic of enemies, let's talk about the bosses. A lot of old school 2D platformers tended to keep it overly simple with their bosses, so I kind of expected this game to do the same. But much to my surprise, these bosses are far more elaborate than I anticipated. Literally the first boss had attack patterns you'd be seeing K. Rool using at the end of DKC2. But that said, these bosses were honestly a pretty refreshing challenge, without feeling like difficulty spikes. Mostly. The first two bosses are both solid, with the second one having you use the bird form, which was kind of a neat surprise. The third boss is probably my favorite in the game, but man did it give me a butt kicking. This one really expects you to have mastered the tiger form's abilities, but once I got a hang of the attack patterns, this one was really satisfying to go through. But then there's the matter of the final boss, the sorceress from the opening, whose name is Typhoon, apparently. Now I will say, this is a cool fight, having you platform around, avoiding massive lasers, while collecting gems in order to eventually leave Typhoon vulnerable for an attack. However, I do think this fight's a bit too much of a difficulty spike. After each hit you deal to Typhoon, you go through a brief portion as one of the other forms, and counting these and the previously mentioned gem collecting parts, this boss has a total of seven phases. Three of the gem collecting parts, three interludes for the bird, shark, and dragon forms, and a final chase sequence with the tiger form. And in original mode, across all these phases, you get a total of two hits. You get hit twice, and you're going all the way back to the first phase. Now yes, with the other bosses it works the same way. Get hit twice, go back to the beginning. But with those other fights, you were using the same form consistently throughout. In this boss, things are constantly changing, and with very little room for error. It's basically animal antics from DKC2, but as a boss fight and without checkpoints or a means to get the extra hit point back. This boss alone took me well over 20 minutes, with two of my attempts resulting in death literally at the final blow. To clarify, I wouldn't call this an outright bad boss fight, but it does push the difficulty up a bit too high a bit too suddenly. Now as I said earlier, I really like this game's visuals. While the gameplay is basically Donkey Kong Country, the graphics go a very different direction, instead going for a more traditionally cartoony pixel art style. Now yes, there's a lot of 2D platformers that go for this art style, but Kazi does feel distinct enough, with simple but effective character designs, and some really creative uses of food with the enemies, and as I noted earlier, a lovely color palette with the environments. Now as for the music, while it is good, I'll admit that none of its soundtrack really stuck with me. And with the soundtrack not available online, as far as I'm aware at least, I wasn't able to listen to the tracks on their own to see if any would click. DKC this game was not, in regards to its soundtrack at least. Then again, David Wise's work on those games is a hard feat to match. But anyway, that should cover just about everything with this game. While it does take a lot directly from Donkey Kong Country, Kazan of the Wild Masks still has enough going for it to be viewed and valued as its own experience, and it's a game I would personally recommend. It managed to scratch an itch that I didn't even realize I had for an SNES style 2D platform platformer, especially reminiscent of the DKC games. And hey, it's practically on everything! PS4 and PS5, Xbox One and Series X, Switch, Steam, even the Stadia got a piece of the pie. Now it is relatively short, with my 100% playthrough clocking in at 5.5 hours, but with the kind of game it is, its price point will likely be covered by multiple playthroughs. The game also has additional optional challenges that don't play into 100%ing, such as time trials or beating levels without taking any damage, so there's more ways to play through the game than just the standard way. Speaking personally, I definitely felt like I got my money's worth, and I'm sure I'll end up playing through it again in the future. Might even doubled up and get the Switch version. I feel like this game could benefit from being able to be played on the go. But anyway, that's all I've got to say for this time around. This has been Black Mage Benjamin, and until the next video, have a nice day everybody.